about time for us to begin our afternoon service. It's uh, typically five o'clock, but uh, I guess you got the memo that it was at one, and we're glad to see each and every one of you here. I see a few visitors, and uh, we're thankful you're here, and uh, we do have a visitor card if you could fill that out for us so we get a record of your attendance, and uh, if there's anything that we can do for you, please let us know, but we're glad you're here. Um, most of you heard the announcements this morning, so I won't won't go over that, um, but uh, there is an all-student Devo tonight at 5 p.m. at the home of uh, Tim and Libby, so just want to continue our fellowship all day long and hope you can support that. Our opening song will be 236. Our opening prayer will be by Brother Charles Collins, our closing prayer by Glenn Lewis. We'll begin now as Greg will uh, read from God's Word. I'll be reading Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sheep sleep, for he, gives, for he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They, are not, they, are, they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we're thankful for the afternoon. We thank you for the opportunity that we have in front of us to come to you in prayer and in song. And Father, may we open up our minds and hearts and as Brother Holland delivers the message this afternoon, may it sink into our hearts that we may grow stronger in love and in trust to you. For we know that you do care for us, you do love us, and we want to know more about you and to do your will. Heavenly Father, there are several that are not with us today that are out sick, and we pray for their strength and healing. We pray for Eugene and Edna Renfro for his ongoing sickness, and pray that you'll be with those that's providing for uh, his comfort. Pray for Tom and Sandra Horn, and Howell Todd, and, and uh, others that uh, we may not be aware of, that you'll watch over them and strengthen them. We thank you that Brother Lois is back with us and uh, is improving. We pray for uh, Brother MacArthur and Brother Emmett and their ongoing uh, illnesses. We pray for strength to them. We pray for our elders, uh, the things that they do. Pray that uh, you'll watch over them and guide them, and we know that they turn to you for direction. Father, we pray for our missionaries, the work that's going on. We pray for continued support from our congregation. We know that they have difficult times, and uh, we pray that you'll watch over them. We pray, Father, for our country. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy for living in such a great country and such a good environment. Father, we know that around our country there are things that are going on that we know you're not pleased with in other parts of this world in turmoil. We pray, Father, that you just be patient with us. We thank you for loving us and caring for us as you do. Pray that you'll continue to guide us as we go through this week and help us to be supportive of our gospel meeting. And again, we thank you for Brother Holland and the service. Uh, we just pray that he'll continue to have uh, much more time to deliver your message. Thank you for just being with us. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Two hundred thirty six will do the first, second, and the last stanzas, please. <clears throat> I found my Lord and he
Number 125, 125, do you know my Jesus? We'll do the first and the last stanzas of this, please. <clears throat> Have you a books 356 we'll sing that as a song of encouragement after the lesson 356 <clears throat> and now we'll sing number 660 the first second and fourth stanza 660 uh, after this song and uh, we'll have brother Tim up to introduce again briefly brother Tom Holland and then have him speak I'd like for you to stand if you'd like to, only 660, first, second, and last. <clears throat> there is
Well, we've already had a great day. We have been fed three times already. Twice by Brother Holland with the Word of God, and then a good meal a while ago, and we're about to have a fourth, and we're looking forward to that. If you've just come in at this hour, and some of you have, you have come to hear Brother Tom Holland, as we have had him this week in our meeting, just beginning, looking forward to Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. We hope that you can be here for those services as well. When you mention those who preachers like to hear, Brother Tom Holland's name is going to come up. I mentioned earlier that uh, Brother Holland has been a regular speaker at Polishing the Pulpit for a number of years. I don't know how many. You'd have to tell how many he's been involved from many years ago. And the lectures that he gives are always filled with men who preach regularly because they know that Brother Tom Holland, with his insight in Scripture, with his love for the truth, with his desire to help people understand the will of God, will bring what they want to hear. And that is the truth from the message of the Word of God. We're thankful that Brother Holland's health has allowed him to come and be with us. We pray fervently that, that he will continue to serve for many years in the Lord's kingdom. And we're just delighted that we have this week to be with him. We're thankful that Brother Tom Holland is with us today. We hope you get to hear every service. And without any more taking of his time today, Brother Tom. Thank you for your patience while I climb up here. I want to disabuse your minds of something that has concerned me. I was preaching somewhere and closed the service. A lady came out and said, oh, I hurt for you the whole time you were up there. I thought that old man up there in that pain preaching. I'm not in pain. I've surprised two doctors in Nashville. One's a Vanderbilt back specialist. He assumed I, I, it's the Lord. And the surgeon that operated on me, it's the Lord. I'm not in pain. I just have a little trouble getting around sometimes. But I thank my God every day that I can still go and do his work. Tim, I thank you so much for your gracious words today. And uh, I, I treasure this day the rest of my life, I promise you. Just to be with you is a great privilege and opportunity. Now, after those of you who told me, that you always take a nap after you eat. It puts me in a kind of dilemma. Should I bid you good afternoon or good night? So I hope that maybe I can help keep you awake because this is a great lesson from the Word of God, not because I'm presenting it, because it's in the Word of God. If you want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 9 and look at verses 23 and 24, what if I told you this afternoon that you could accomplish something so significant with your life that you would make a lasting impression. You know, there are men and women who accomplish great things in life. Sometimes they are recognized Nobel Prize winner. And sometimes they are put down in history books as people who have accomplished almost impossible things. The Wright brothers, for example, running a bicycle shop, went over to Kitty Hawk and after a long time demonstrated that it's possible really to fly. And you know, the newspaper from their hometown wrote about that. You know what the headline of the paper said, Wright brothers hope to be home by Christmas. Totally missed the point. I mean, these guys were demonstrating the possibility of flying. So. I think about all of these great accomplishments that people have been able to do with their lives. But all of us can accomplish great things. God tells us we can. And if, if you and I accomplish what Jeremiah says that we may succeed in doing, we will have made our mark. Please don't write yourself off yet. Now, in case you think this old prophet eccentric Jeremiah 
has no message for our day. I promise you. Who is the prophet that God used to tell humanity, really, I'm going to make a new covenant? God had made a covenant with the descendants of Abraham at Mount Sinai. God said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, and I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's Jeremiah 31 and 34. It's quoted almost exactly that way in your New Testament in Hebrews chapter 8. So God said, I'm going to make a covenant. We are under that covenant in the New Testament era. And he says, I will put my laws in their minds. Christianity, New Testament Christianity, is not anti-intellectual. It's unfortunate it seems so much emphasis today is put on how you feel, what are your emotions, and not enough stress being put on loving God with your mind. It's like a, a lady in Kentucky told me at the end of a meeting one time, said, well, I'm very glad I could come to this meeting and not have to leave my brains at home. I said, you're never to leave your brains at home when you're dealing with the will of God. You have to use your mind. And God said, I will put it also in their hearts. We're going to love God with our hearts. We're going to love the Lord Jesus Christ with our hearts. And so consequently, we have a, and this is Jeremiah now, that's predicting this. And so it's true that sometimes we see things from a different perspective than God has. For example, the church at Sardis, Revelation 3.1, said, uh, we're alive, God said you're dead. Read on down to verse 17, Laodicea. Laodicea church said, we're rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. God said, you're poor and wretched and blind and naked. Or take Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, we don't usually look at it like that. To us, it's a time of sorrow, time of disappointment. But from God's perspective, if I'm a child of God, for God to take me to himself, that's a precious thing in his sight. And it may be that people sometimes have their own criteria for what makes a person great, and then God has his. And we're going to look at God's because when we look at God's, we all can be great people. So here we are with Jeremiah. Verse 23, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the wealthy man glory in his wealth, or some translations say riches. But he that glorieth, let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, that I exercise loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth, for these are precious in my sight. Okay, we'll take those individually. Number one, how many people glory in their wisdom? How many people want to be known for what they have accomplished that has demonstrated intelligence all the way from educational degrees to maybe some tremendous accomplishment? Well, let not that man glory in his wisdom. Human wisdom has its limitations. With an individual, it's just, you know, coextensive with him. And when he leaves this world, it goes with him. I've often thought about this man. I'm thinking about a man, a dear brother in Christ, that was a prominent ophthalmologist. Oh, he, he knew how to do surgery and help people see. And I thought when he died from a heart problem, how much wisdom had to leave, how many people he potentially could have helped. But that's, that's one of the problems with human wisdom. And another problem with human wisdom it's not quite as extensive as sometimes we imagine that it is. 
A person can be quite knowledgeable in one area and lacking in knowledge in another area and leave the impression that he knows it in every area. I'll give you an example. Stephen Gould at one time was a prominent evolutionist teaching at Harvard. And he once made this observation, and this is a quote, Now that we know we're not made in anyone's image, we are free to do what we choose, end of quote. Not made in anyone's image? Well, I'm made in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And that does not leave me with the wisdom to do anything that I want to do. That could get me into some very serious trouble. And then I think about, I mentioned Richard Dawkins today, evolutionist at Harvard, at Oxford, I'm sorry. And, but the problem, he's knowledgeable supposedly in that area, but in uh, biochemistry, he, he doesn't have it. And if he had knowledge in that area, he might be like Michael Behe, who wrote the book Darwin's Black Box. And he mentions such things in that book as visual perception. Takes him about three pages to explain the change in proteins and the process that takes place so that technically we see with the brain. The eye is the camera to get the message to the brain. It's a calm, what you're doing right now, looking at me. That's a complex accomplishment that's happening right there. And for me to imagine that all that came from what they used to argue a simple cell, that is absolutely incredible. So here's a fellow that says uh, he, he can speak in the area of evolution, but he knows nothing about biochemistry. And so you get into that problem with human wisdom. But I'm thinking of it more from the standpoint of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And when Paul is quoting from Isaiah 29 here, Paul says in the Corinthian letter, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto those who are called both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles. Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know you think in terms of the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. God has obviously impressed on his created universe, his laws. We call them laws of nature. And men and women of science, they work to discover the laws God has impressed on his created universe. But when it comes to the spiritual realm, the part of me that's destined for eternity, thus thou art to dust, returnest was never spoken of the soul, the poet said. When it comes to that, it's not a matter of discovering laws God has impressed, but laws God has expressed. And the expression is given here in the sacred scripture. So I think about the world by its wisdom couldn't know God. When you read efforts of people to discover reality apart from revelation, I'm thinking about Plato, for example, and, and his idea that out there in the other realm, that there's a type of a model for everything that exists. These, these people were floundering around trying to find God apart from a revelation of God. And that is an impossibility. But I can take this revelation of God and I can commence to understand his reality. I can understand his nature and I can appreciate his mercy. I can be blessed by his grace I can be the recipient of expressions of his love, and particularly, and, and you know this one, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You, you could quote that verse, probably one of the best known verses in all Scripture, John 3, 16. But a lot of times people will quote that verse, whosoever believeth in him, and never explain what it means to believe in Christ. Belief is a comprehensive term, 
Belief includes every command the Lord has given. And hereby you know that you know him if you do what he says do. 1 John 2, starting in verse 3. So if you take something like repenting, that's a human activity. God commands men everywhere to repent. And yet it's a God-ordained activity. It's a work of God, if you please. Same thing is true with baptism. Baptism is an act of faith. A lot of folks don't understand that. To them, it's just getting ducked in the water. Oh, no. Without the faith, there's nothing to it but getting wet in water. But you take a passage like Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Baptism is a tremendous act of faith. And it's an act that leads me to conclude that when I obey the Lord's command to be baptized, then my sins will be washed away. A very sinful man, a man who once said, I'm the chief of sinners, that man had tried to destroy the church of Christ. He hated it with a passion. And yet at the same time, he was fighting against the Lord. And when he came to realize that Jesus was a reality, and uh, he was told, go into the city and it'll be told you what you must do. And a God-sent preacher by the name of Ananias said, Why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. What does God do when he operates? He washes away my sins. God said their sins and their iniquities I remember no more. That's an act of God in baptism. And, and people a lot of times, good people have never been taught it. They've been prejudiced against it. And they don't see the correlation of faith and obeying that command. But when you consider that it's wise, really, to do what God says, and the world has trouble believing that, it's going to make a better person out of you if you do, and it's going to also impress upon you the true values of life. A lot of folks are confused about the true values of life. Now look at the next one. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. They say the president of this country is the most powerful person in the world. Well, the most powerful person with whom we have any contact is God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. No frail human being has the power of an omnipotent God. So when I think about great men of the past from the standpoint of power, you know the Old Testament is full of examples of men of power, who didn't keep it all that long? I'll give you an example. Nebuchadnezzar headed an empire, a world empire, the Babylonian Empire. That empire was so strong, they controlled so much of their world at that time. They could come to Jerusalem, and they could completely destroy that city. And the beautiful temple that Solomon had dedicated to the glory of God that took seven years to build with 80,000 people work out in the quarry, 70,000 people there in Jerusalem, 30,000 sent up into Lebanon to bring down the trees for the cedar for the interior of that building, 3,300 overseers, all that multitude of people working seven years to build that beautiful house, and the Babylonians could burn it down and tear it down in almost a moment. But you know that... That great wise man, Nebuchadnezzar, when he became sold on his power, God let him experience what it means to lose it. And this great, powerful man started actually just kind of behaving like an insane person, eating grass and just... And God made him know that God rules in the kingdoms of men and I want to parenthetically reassure us that he's the same God today. People are upset. I meet a lot of folks that say, why does God let this nation continue? When Sodom got in its, its condition, God wiped it off the earth. I'm telling people, don't forget, if they had had 10 people, righteous people, they could have spared Sodom. You and I may be the people sparing this country, and, and, and folks don't even realize it and could care less about it. Don't ever underestimate the power of righteousness from God's perspective because God says, I delight in righteousness. 
That's verse 24 of Jeremiah, right? And these I delight in righteousness, right doing, as decreed by God and declared in his word, loving your neighbor as yourself, having respect for people and mankind. We live in an age when people need a healthy dose of respect for other people. If you teach in school, you probably understand what I'm talking about. Children that have never been taught respect, they have no respect for you, and we have a culture today that has trouble respecting anyone in a position of authority, as they would imagine. That would include maybe a judge, a policeman, or an elder in God's church. Resentment of authority. You know, I don't have time to explore to you the pluralism that brings that about, that was fostered on religion through postmodernism, they call it. But when I think about people that are so powerful today, one assassin's bullet can shut down that power of that person in a matter of seconds. An airplane crash can take that powerful person and reduce it to a memory in no time. Don't glory in your power. All right, now what about the next one? How many people want to evaluate folks on the basis of how much they have materially? And, and you know, I read about these people, and they seem to be boasting. Here's a fellow that says, uh, you know, he's worth $12 billion. Now, that must be a lot of money, except in certain areas of government when they are planning to give it away. But from my perspective, $12 billion, man, that's more than I have made preaching and teaching school for 65 years. That to me is a lot of money. I'm just checking to see if you're awake. So when I, when I think about people glorying in their wealth, and, and here's a fella, and, and this utterly amazes me. He publishes that he's worth $12 billion. And yet they run ads on television helping the poor people in Israel. When he's sitting on $12 billion, Man, why doesn't he help some of those poor people? That's his problem and not mine. I'm just telling you. Don't let the wealthy person glow in his wealth. I guess one of the richest men on earth today is Bill Gates. You know what Bill Gates is trying to do at this point in his life? Give his money away. He knows he can't take it with him. That's one of the problems. Now, one brilliant fellow said, I know I can't take it with me. I plan for my wife to bring it. I've got news for him. She won't bring it either. I read in an old book one time, we brought nothing into this world, and it's for certain we'll carry nothing out. You read it too, didn't you? First Timothy chapter 6. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. And they that will be rich fall into many hurtful lusts. And they can, he says, can be drowned in these kinds of lust for greed. So... You have a problem here. Don't glory in riches. Riches are fragile. Evidently, our world today is loaded with people that are trying to figure out some scam, some way they can scam off what you've got. And uh, I just said one of my sons and his wife have been in an ordeal. They filed their income tax and they were noted notified by the IRS, they'd already filed an income tax. Somebody had stolen their identity, had filed a false report on each of them. Now they've got all kinds of trouble trying to get all of that straightened out. Some scam artist somewhere is out there trying to figure out. They prey on folks my age. And I promise you something. If you ever give to an organization that is going to be fighting for your rights. They will sell your name to every other organization and they will flood you with information. You say, you must know a lot about that. Yeah, I have to throw it away every day. I mean, and they don't have a synonym for the word fight. They're fighting. Everybody is fighting over there. I wish they'd learn at least one synonym for it, but I get so disgusted with that. And you know, I get these things, I guess you get them, they, they send these surveys out, and my opinion is so important. They want me to send that back, and always with a contribution. 
Well, my thinking is, if my opinion is that important, you ought to be paying me to get my opinion. They got the thing kind of out of balance from my perspective. Don't glory in wealth. You're not going to take it with you. And somebody is going to try to take it from you. That's the nature of wealth. All right, now, if you want to glory, God says, I'll tell you how to do it. He that glory, let him glory in this, he understands and knows me. So that's the question. How well do I know God? Do I know him as Lord? He says, know that I am Lord. God is the absolute ruler. He's in control. And like you read in the book of Daniel, and God tried to teach this to old Nebuchadnezzar, God rules in the kingdoms of men. He's the same God. And my hope today is that God is going to overrule all of the forces that are diligently working, trying to rob us of our Christian heritage in this nation. This nation was built on God. Now, that can be shown from documents ranging all the way from the Declaration of Independence right on down to the origin of American law that was borrowed from England law, and England law was borrowed primarily from a prominent jurist by the name of William Blackstone. And Blackstone started out with the idea that all freedom and rights belong to us because of God. He was a believer in God, believed in the Word of God, and claimed to be a Christian. So that was the origin, really, of English law in those commentaries that he published from 1960, uh, 16 and 60 to 16 and 70. But be that as it may, I know God, I understand God, that he exercises loving kindness. You know, that's one of the beautiful, of uh, many beautiful things about God. When people try to create their own gods, I'll give you one example. You take... Uh, that God of the Moabites and the fire God of the Ammonites. Oh, Molech, fire God of the Ammonites, made out of metal with a huge stomach and protruding arms. They'd build a roaring fire in that stomach and bring their little babies and lay them in arms to Molech and burn them as an act of worship. God said, that kind of thing never entered my mind. It's infanticide that's being practiced in America today, like old Manasseh who filled the streets of Jerusalem with blood. Abortion clinics have filled this country with blood and partial birth abortion, as I heard a U.S. Senator make a speech at Freed Hardman say, that is infanticide. And he's exactly right. I think in terms of God, the true God is a loving God and he wants us to understand his loving kindness. There may be times when you wonder about it. There may be people right now in beds of affliction that wonder about it. But in, in the context of eternity, God is a loving God. And sometimes we have to wait to see the goodness of God. David hoped to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Sometimes we may have to wait and get the eternal perspective on the goodness of God. But he wants us to understand that he fills the earth with loving kindness and judgment. You know, God's a holy God. People may shake their fist in his face for a while, but there's a great day coming. There's a great day coming when those who have practiced man's inhumanity to man when people have done what I call subhuman acts on other people, the atrocities that have been committed and are being committed. I know a lot of these folks are on drugs. I know a lot of it's done when people are under the influence of alcohol or other drugs. But at the same time, when you go into a movie theater and you see how many people you murder, that's evil, folks. They're trying the fellow right now, and he's pleading insanity. Well, there's a little corner of that kind of insanity that's written E-V-I-L. And when you take these two men, young men, 
that went into that high school in Colorado to see how many of their fellow students they could kill. I'm talking about Harrison Klebo. And when they walked up to that one girl and said, do you believe in God? She said, I do, and they shot her in the head. That's evil, folks. Now, you can say, well, those, somebody said, well, I understand they'd been involved in devil worship. I don't care what they'd been involved in. They were practitioners of evil. There is such a thing. And in contrast to a loving God, there is man's evil. And that's a reflection on the God who has created us to reflect his own image. God says, I want you to understand that I exercise loving kindness, but also justice and righteousness. You know, when we act like human beings ought to act, and we treat other human beings with respect, consideration, and kindness, that reflects good on the God who created us. And as Christians, it reflects upon our Lord Jesus Christ who has recreated us or remade us, given us new life and a new birth. That reflects on him for good. But it doesn't reflect good when we have brethren who evidently have never read Ephesians 4.32. It's in your Bible. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There are some people who seem to be experts in judgmental, pharisaical statements they make to other brothers and sisters. There are things said to elders of God's church that should never have been spoken. There are things said to and about preachers. I just recently learned, and a lot of you knew this man. I love this man dearly. I held meetings where this man preached in Huntsville. I don't know how many meetings I've held for that congregation. And I only recently learned when his widow visited a service out at Swearingen that sometimes he would get up in the pulpit and there would be notes left for him telling him what a sorry preacher he was. I thought of all the incredible things. Now, I've gotten my share of anonymous letters. I guess Tim probably has tasted that too. I used to put those things in a folder. I, I was collecting me a folder full of those things. And uh, then I don't fool with them anymore. I've got better use for my time than to waste it on a person that doesn't have the courage to tell me what he thinks or what she thinks about me. Now, some folks do have the courage. I've had my pedigree read at four years of church buildings a few times in my life, but I've survived it. I'm just telling you, I want to be kind to people because I want folks to be kind to me. And the people like you that are kind to me, they make up for those that aren't because yours are far more important to me than theirs. God said, I exercise righteousness. He wants us to do right. Now, a lot of folks are kind of like they were in the days of the prophet Isaiah. Some folks call light darkness, darkness light. They're like a lady in North Carolina said, in the moral realm, I only have one little problem. I just can't tell right from wrong. There are a lot of folks that have that little problem. But if you take this word right here, you can discern what is right and what is wrong because it's laid out in a way. It's not rocket science to read Second Peter and see people that have escaped the corruption in the world, what they are to put into their characters. You know, those seven things called the Christian graces. Everyone's practical. You can do those things. I can do those things. It's, it's a practical life, but it's a precious life. It's a rewarding life. It's, it's a life that blesses other people. How would you like to live in a community where you didn't have to lock your doors, didn't have to have alarms on your cars? How would you like to live in a community where if, if somebody had difficulty, all the neighbors are going to respond immediately to try to help? You do understand, don't you, that there is built into the American psyche a benevolent attitude. We got this from our Christian forebearers. That's a part of our heritage. You let somebody run into, I don't care if it's a foreign government. What about the United States responding to tsunamis for Indonesia, for example? It's built into our system. That's a commendation of the American people to have that kind of loving, caring attitude. So when I think about God exercising loving kindness 
God exercising judgment and righteousness and the fact that he is Lord. Understand those things, God said, and that makes you great. They might, may not give you a prize of any kind. They may not write you up in a history book. But I'll tell you where you're written. Up yonder, your, your name's put in the Lamb's Book of Life. And in the last great day, that's what will really count. Because when John had the vision of the conclusion of it all, those that were not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life were cast into a lake of fire. We all can, can accomplish, people, the greatest thing on earth, and that's knowing God and understanding God. And with that, we are tying into eternity itself. Thank you so much for being here for this afternoon service and for your attention. I think most of us have been able to, to stay awake. I'm glad to be at Maysville with you. You are the kind of folks that make me glad I preach. And uh, I thank you for every kindness. And through the years, there have been plenty of them from this congregation. Carrie's going to lead us in singing a song to encourage anyone here who needs to respond to the Lord's invitation. Not mine, not Tim's, not the invitation of the elders, this, the Lord's. He said, come unto me, I'll give you rest. He calls us by his gospel. There are people that cannot hear the call because they've been prejudiced against it. They're indifferent toward it. They're preoccupied with other things. But if you want to really be successful, let God make you successful, even eternally. If you need to walk down one of these aisles with the faith that would lead you to be baptized into Christ, you have the opportunity. If you need to come home to be renewed in the determination again to live for the one who died for you until you're safe at home above the bright blue, this is your opportunity and your invitation while we sing. Brother Holland for that lesson again and um, we appreciate uh, all the messages today and the fellowship with you. And let the news media tell us what happens when people decide they don't need God anymore. They knew God, they knew the Lord found as God and oh the consequences laid out and they reported the news every day all the way from a movement that we have same sex so called that's oxymoron movement right on down to the murders and the disobedient parents the whole sad story comes out of people who would refuse to retain a knowledge of God. Hope you come back to be with us for that. All right.
appreciate that uh, uh, pre-information there. That ought to excite us about being back tomorrow night to hear about that. And uh, at 7 o'clock, uh, some of you be here to, to join him in a meal at 6. And uh, bring somebody with you. Uh, look around, find your neighbors and friends that you can bring with you tomorrow night at 7 again, and we'll enjoy another worship together. 430, number 430. We'll do the first and the last stanzas of this and then be dismissed in our closing prayer. <clears throat> My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife and read my title clear. I know, I know, I do. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the day that you've given us to assemble here and hear the words that, that were spoken so that we can, we know they came from your word, and we can take your word out to the streets and, and spread it to all those folks that are lost. Father, help us to, to always live our lives in a manner that, that brings honor and glory to you and makes the world realize that there's something better than what we see here. Father, be with us as we depart this place. Help us to come back and support this meeting every night that we can. Forgive us of our sins, in Jesus' name, amen.